expense than they can do on their own. They don't have to guess on capacity. They can move quicker, which enables a lot more innovation. They get to spend their scarce SDE resource on projects that move the business forward. And they can go global with their application presence in minutes. I thought I would. And this is Silicon Angles, the Cube. Our continuous production of AWS live wall-to-wall -wall coverage, AWS Summit. We're here at Moscone Center in San Francisco. AWS, Amazon has a number of these events, probably like a dozen around the world, uh, really keying off its big conference, which is the reInvent uh, event in November. It's in, it's in Vegas and a uh, big event. And now they go to these regional events to really help customers. It's much more intimate help customers understand you know, what they're doing, maybe make some new announcements, bring in the local ecosystem. Uh, and I'm here with my co-host, Jeff Frick. Jeff, we've been here all day, going at it. Uh, we were at the OpenStack Summit, uh, I guess it was last week or the week before. Tom Shields is here. He's the Senior Director of Cloud Marketing at NetApp. Tom, welcome to theCUBE. Thanks, thanks for having me. You're welcome. So, let's start with NetApp's cloud play. I mean, how would you generalize NetApp's play in the cloud, generally? Yeah, I think we're pretty unique. Unlike some of our competitors, we're not trying to be a cloud service provider. We work exclusively through service providers. We, we treat them as partners, not as direct customers. Um, and so they are our channel. So for our enterprise users who want to use cloud services, we will promote our cloud service providers to our enterprise as solutions. Okay, so um, let's now talk specifically about your AWS play. What, you guys made an announcement in November. Uh, talk about that and talk about how that's going, how it's evolved and where we're at today. Yeah, um, we got together with AWS. What we saw happening in the enterprise, that many of our customers uh, were starting to use AWS. They started talking to us about that. Um, they want to get in and use the benefits of public cloud. The flexibility, the cost efficiencies are very attractive. At the same time, they appreciate the performance characteristics, the availability, the security of their NetApp storage. And so for NetApp Enterprise customers, um, we were looking to create a way where they could start to get into the public cloud, yet keep the benefits of their NetApp storage. And so that's why we developed a solution with Amazon Web Services. Okay, so uh, talk about what that solution is, what it does, maybe traction in the marketplace, who's using it, how they're using it, we'll get into that whole thing. You can sure. take any one of those questions that you like. <laughs> you <laughs> sure. like the talk portfolio about, question. Talk about the solution itself. What is it, what does it do? Yeah, well the, the solution is NetApp Private Storage for Amazon Web Services. And what it is, it's a combination of Amazon EC2, Amazon Direct Connect, and NetApp Storage and Data Management. And what enables it is the Direct Connect technology that AWS brought out in 2011. So it's a high bandwidth dark fiber connection that allows you to connect the, the core Amazon cloud to a third party data center. So now what you're able to do with that direct connect data center is put a NetApp device in there, connect up to Amazon EC2. Uh, the data centers are very close to the AWS fleet, literally across the street. So you have a very low latency, high bandwidth connection. So the whole stack now operates as if it's in the same rack. So you consider it a very high performance, low latency stack Parts of it are in the cloud, you rent those, the storage is NetApp and you control that and own that. So it's a synchronous <clears throat> yeah, uh, it, it functions location. Like, it functions as if it were all in the same rack together. So you can tackle a, a host of jobs that you know you would use a flex pod for normally on-prem. Okay, and that that third party data you're saying that third party data center is proximate to the, the Amazon correct, data correct. center, is that right? In most cases it's right across the street. So, so we use we use a Quinix. Equinix is um, you know, one of the partners that we've chosen to go to market with first here. They have more direct connect facilities than anybody else around the world. Um, so we're with them here in, in the United States, down in the Bay Area, out in Virginia, uh, out in Tokyo, Singapore, and now Australia. Soon we'll be in Europe with Equinix. And so these are all direct connect facilities that are close to the AWS fleet. 
Okay, so AWS obviously, I think Equinix has more data centers around the world than AWS obviously, right? They've been around for a long, long yes. time. And Not all of them are direct connect facilities. The ones that are close to, to the AWS fleet are. So how did you guys like come to this? You just, you just sort of, one day it's hit somebody, hey, we've got <laughs> this relationship with, with Equinix, we've got AWS growing like crazy globally, we could maybe start talking together and put yeah, together the no, solution? It's, uh, I think we found each other through our enterprise customers. You know, as Amazon started to become more focused on the enterprise space, moving from web 2.0 up into the enterprise, they've encountered a, you know, a large and loyal enterprise installed base with NetApp. Uh, and those customers love NetApp. Um, at the same time, you know, we have feelers all over the place and we understand that our enterprise customers are using, using uh, Amazon today. They're doing dev tests with Amazon. IT departments want to do more with it. And they want to find a way to do it and yet still control the data and uh, have some visibility to what's happening in the organization. So our customers are asking us to work together. That's the bottom line. So, okay. so is more of the data then going to the Direct Connect data center across the street then to, to remove, because it seems like you're still going to have them that long, that long leg, long haul. Yeah, remember, we're, we're talking mainly to NetApp customers that are moving from doing things on-prem and starting to want to get into the public cloud. So they're moving from an on-prem world and they're looking to, to start to use public cloud. For them, it's, it's, it's a, a nice first step to be able to keep the, the familiar storage, data management on NetApp and reach up and grab all the efficiencies and flexibility of the Amazon EC2 cloud. So that's primarily where we see the use cases as can, people get started. Can S3 play in this equation? S3 can play in this equation. We do have a use case there. Um, many customers want to replace tape. They want a more reliable, um, cost-effective alternative to tape. And they can get that in S3 Glacier. And so we do have customers, we have one large oil company that wants to consolidate backup and recovery and replace tape. What they'll do is they'll use NetApp uh, snapshots locally in, in their multiple data centers. They'll consolidate two weeks of backup in the Direct Connect Colo facility. So they get two weeks of restore. That's just happening. That's just happening yeah. real time over time. And then yeah, they'll use Net native replication, NetApp okay. replication to move data over to that Colo. And then that data that's older than two weeks, they want to park that up in S3 Glacier. So Glacier is a penny per gigabyte per month. You know, very cost effective. It's spinning disk, so it's more reliable than tape, you know, and, and people like that story. It's easier to just, you know, to end a life data on that solution. Uh, and so it provides some nice value there. So there's a lot of interest in that. Is spinning disk really more reliable than tape? I didn't know so that. So our customers believe that. <laughs> Do you have data on that? <laughs> that sounds like that sounds like a good a good sound bite. I mean I didn't know that, but uh, but I would I would think that most customers would want data on spinning disk is the point, because it's so much more convenient. Although, I, my guess is if you put it into Glacier, you hope you never have to go get it, but it's cheap and you know it's there if you do have to go get it. That's, that's right. Um, it seems like a key to your solution is, again, this notion of being proximate to the Amazon data centers, um, especially from a performance standpoint. If I'm moving data around, I don't want to move it long distances. It takes a long time to move a, a terabyte. Is that right, and can you talk about the importance of that? Yeah, that's right, the data has gravity, so players here at Amazon have said that, and it's, it's not like you move it around um, willy-nilly, you know, and, and people like to um, to know where it is. And, um, you know, with NetApp, a lot of times what, what we'll do to get started is make a big data transfer, right, to that colo facility. But then once we've got that in place, we can make incremental uh, data changes over the wide area network using native NetApp replication, which just sends change block data over the wire. So you can get a relatively um, you know, efficient transfer process going. It doesn't cost too much. And so you can literally think about the Direct Connect facility and your NetApp on-prem um, creating a hybrid cloud with the data moving back and forth. You might develop up in the NetApp private storage for AWS environment and then want to move that data back on-prem and, and run the whole thing on your own stack. You can do that because you control the data flow across prem and NetApp private storage for AWS. Yeah, so you guys have nice snapshot technology to allow, allow you to do that Absolutely, that's CDP. A, core, a core value for NetApp. It's very efficient data transfer. So the, the key there for a customer though is seeding that that installation yep, initially. Yep. If so it's big data, you got to seed it. What's, big, what's best practice? How do, you, how do you do that? Do you have tools to help me throttle? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, there's tools. There's you know we'd have to have a longer conversation. Everybody on. hates this common topic, <laughs> I know, but I mean it's, it's but for customers out there, it's a it's the, it's a big consideration, right? Yeah, and no, so, a lot of times people will just move move a filer over from their 
put, put it on a truck. In their prem and move it over to the to literally Cola. put it on a no, truck. No, no. Yeah, yeah. That's probably the best move, right? I mean, yeah. Sometimes when you move uh, a whole lot of uh, atoms or bits, they become like atoms. So. You know what that's called? That's the CTAM. It's a sneaker net. CTAM. It's a Chevy more. truck access method. <laughs> it's, uh, so for all you old mainframers out there. That, okay. That's so that's interesting. All right. So um, so. So that's something that they have to think about. That's probably the best way to do it. Is if they don't, then they can trickle it over, and it takes whatever. Once you've got your data, you know the, the bulk of the data over there, then you can really take advantage of the efficient replication data movement that NetApp has, and yeah. it's very inexpensive. Yeah, yeah. Once it's there, it's it's a, it's really sort of everyday operations. Talk about um, some of the customers that you have. Name names if you can. If not, I understand. But maybe the types of customers and and what they're right. doing. Right. Yeah, the, the, the fun thing about this is that we're discovering new use cases every day. But if I look across our pipeline and the customers that are using it today, several use cases really stand out. Uh, the DR is really the first one that I'd like to talk about. Best way to talk about it is to use a customer example. So a lot of customers have a hard time figuring out how to afford a full redundant stack you know, in a remote location to use as a DR site. Um, so for mid-sized business, this solution is really nice because they can put a NetApp device in the co-location facility and then they can use reserved instances up in the EC2 cloud, right? And they're very cheap discounted instances, but you're guaranteed to get them if you need them for failover purposes or for testing purposes. And so only when you test DR or fail over are you really paying for using the Amazon cloud, you know, paying big. Um, and so it's a much more cost-effective way to go for DR. So that's a primary use case that we see. Another, and it's very common, is, is just wanting to rationalize compute infrastructure. So we have many customers coming from using VMware on-prem today, uh, you know, on their servers, getting a lot of efficiency there. Now they can move stuff over to Amazon. We have customers that, that um, estimate they can save 70% of their compute infrastructure costs by moving over and using EC2. Now, um, why are they using NetApp? Why do they still want to use NetApp? It's for performance reasons. You know, they've come to rely on the performance profile of NetApp for their applications. And then some of them have concerns around um, security availability, and they've come to appreciate the, the NetApp feature set there. And so they're very comfortable staying with a NetApp storage model and then tapping into EC2 to rationalize compute and save money there. They like NetApp, okay. Yep, so um, there's are two use cases. The, I got more for you. The DR one, I, I, I'm interested in more, but I want to tap, double click into the DR one. A lot of customers tell us in, Wiki, in the Wikibon community that they, they don't adequately, they don't tell us this in public, they tell us this in private, but, but I'll, my inference is they don't adequately test DR because it's too risky and too expensive. Yes. Um, so what you're say, saying, I'm inferring from your comments that you enable more facile, more cost-effective testing so that I can actually go to my board and say, yes, we have a disaster recovery plan, we have tested it, we are in compliance, and they can sleep at night. Absolutely, you know, um, you're familiar with NetApp, we have some technology that enables you to do very low overhead clones of data. Yeah. So you can literally use that technology, flex clones is what we call it, off that um, replicated data set, without breaking the mirror, you can clone that production data and then use that with EC2 to test your, your uh, DR readiness. You don't need to break the mirror. So that's a huge benefit for DR for our customers, and that's only available with NetApp technology. Yeah, yeah, well, it's, uh, you know, NetApp has a lot of inherent advantages because of its architecture, and there are, there are probably dozens of examples like that. Other use cases you want to share with us? Or? Sure, sure, I got a bunch. So, big data analytics, you know. Great. These Love are giant data sets. Some of the data is sensitive. Our customers want to keep that on NetApp storage in some cases, um, and then you know, buy thousands of cores and use them uh, you know, when they do their analytics runs, pay as they go. So it's a nice model. We've got um, an insurance company that's doing actuarial analytics using that model. So that's one. Um, we've got another interesting one, data center consolidation and migration. We've got a Fortune 50 company. They have a very active M&A portfolio. So they're bringing on, you know, buying new companies. Uh, they need to integrate those assets retire some assets, move the data onto new data center resources. So what they're doing is they're using NetApp Private Storage for AWS as a migration hub. So they can literally move this data over very quickly um, and then some of the data will stay there because it's, it's well suited to, um, to taking advantage of the benefits of EC2. Maybe a spiky workload that has seasonality in it. Other data they want to move back on-prem into the new data center. So you've got this notion of transient workloads that move on back on-prem into a new data center, and then you've got permanent workloads that stay. 
within that private storage for AWS. So this whole thing is like a transition hub for M&A activity for retiring old data centers that are no longer efficient. So that's a pretty cool one. And then you've just got, uh, you, know, you know, we talked about the backup use case, you know, there's a lot of people that are interested in that one. Excellent. All right, Tom, listen, we really appreciate you coming on. NetApp, make, making moves in the cloud. Um, NetApp is a company that has reinvented itself many, many times, and you're in that, going through that process again, actually, with, you know, we sure clustered are. on tap, and, uh, and, uh, and we wish you luck with the, the cloud initiative. Tom, thanks very much for coming on theCUBE. Okay, thanks for having me. All right, you're welcome. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be right back with uh, more coverage from AWS. Jeff Frick and myself, you can tweet us questions if you want. I'm at D Vellante, he's at Jeff Frick. This is the cube. Keep it right there. We'll be right back. So, if you're like most businesses, you need lots of data storage to allow your applications to run smoothly and ensure your data is backed up and secure. That means that every time you add an application or your business grows, you need to add more storage. You keep buying storage and hiring more people to manage it.